Today I was going to talk about population three star formation and um, I've been talking the last couple of days about chemistry and cooling in the ISM and really been highlighting the fact that the chemistry in the ISM isn't really doing much to the, uh, to the cooling, okay? So most of the cooling is, is taken over by either uh, C plus um, and dust. And so the chemistry that you're doing there is more of a, for a diagnostic basis, right? You're really wanting to see what happens when you observe um, that simulation and you're trying to compare it to observations. Okay? So population three star formation is a very different regime um, in which the chemistry matters a lot. Okay. Now you don't have very many met you don't have any metals basically, it's just all, all hydrogen and deuterium chemistry uh, for the most part. Um, and so you would think that the chemistry is actually much simpler because you've got less things to do. But the fact is you have to take much better care of the H2 chemistry simply because it is, is, is much more important for the cooling. Okay. Now I should also say that people started doing chemistry in, res in hydrodynamical simulations long before they started doing it. So they started doing it in, in, in population 3 star formation long before they started doing it in present day star formation okay, for the ISM. So people like Tom Abel, Fokker Brom, um, Naoki Yoshida, uh, Kazu Omakai, and, and various other people whose names I've probably forgotten and not mentioned here, have been working out the details of the H2 chemistry for some time. Okay. So what I'm really telling you here is, is, is what's been built up through about a decade of people trying to figure out how H2 works and, and the physics of the H2 and, and, and the hydrogen atom. So where do the first stars form? Just a kind of quick overview. Well, they form in mini halos and dark matter mini halos, which have masses of around about 10 to the 5 solar masses and above. And these mini halos um, become fertile at around about redshifts of between 16 and 20. Okay, so 20 was the was perhaps somewhat of an older estimate. Nowadays, people think it's 16, and the reason why that has changed slightly is that is if we now include the free streaming motions, so the um, the gas should, the baryon should stream um, um, against the, uh, the dark matter um, in the initial conditions of the universe. And then that extra streaming then delays the collapse in the mini halos to run about um, redshift of 16. And so Thomas Greif in a recent paper back in 2011 was showing that with um, using a repo. And the temperature in the mini halos is around about 1,000 Kelvin. And that's really the, um, the variable temperature, right? So that's what happens when you take the kinetic energy of the dark matter in there and try and convert it to a, a physical temperature. And for the most part, that is the temperature that the gas, the baryons, inherit when they fall into that, into that halo. Okay, they're excited up to that temperature and if they can't cool. And the gas density in these sterile hail, in, in these um, sorry fertile halos is around about one gram per cubic centimeter. Okay, so why are these conditions the conditions for population three star formation and what sets it is what we'll be talking about as we go on through the talk. Yeah. What's right? Um, I'll come to that. It depends. Uh, it's the reason why is actually to do with the, with the variable temperature. Okay, so the variable temperature here is, is key here, and I'll come to that in a couple of slides. Good. Yes, good question. It's a right question to be asking. Okay, so just I want to kind of just say briefly how people are doing this in numerical simulations, what the current state of the art is. What you tend to do is you have some large-scale cosmological um, simulation which follows the dark matter and the expansion of the universe. And here's one by a student in our group in Heidelberg, Mei Sazaki. Um, she's been doing this one here, which is a 2,000 cube dark matter particles, and she's got dark matter um, particle masses around about nine solar masses or so, right? So she can resolve the halos where the stars form fairly well in this one, uh, in, in this, in this co-moving megaparsec um, box here, okay? And um, the reason why you, you want to some large part of the universe is you want to be able to see different fluctuations in the dark matter um, power spectrum and see how these different halos um, evolve into, into the pop three stars. Okay. Now, for doing an actual, if you want to zoom in here and actually follow the gas in one of these halos, you probably will have to, again, resolve the dark matter again. So people do these multi-resolved um, 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 zoom-in calculations where they're trying to kind of keep some patch of the, uh, well, some representation of the, of, of the global box, but a lower resolution, then they have gradually increasing resolution as they go into one of the many halos by increasing, by decreasing the, uh, the dark matter particle masses. Okay. Question? There was no gas in the simulation, it's a pure M body. Um, so what May was actually doing here, she wanted to, you know, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very common practice in, in doing uh, population three star formation is that people run a big box like this and they then say, okay, that's the halo that collapses first, I'm going to focus on that, and then they zoom in, and then they work out what the population three stars are, right? 
And then if they want to see any cosmic variance, they run another big box again. They take the first halo to collapse and do that again. Right? So what May wanted to do was she wanted to zoom into many halos within the one box to see if there was, you know, if um, if a uh, if a halo collapses, you know, somewhere else, maybe kind of slightly under density um, compared to the first thing that goes off, will it have different properties for the star formation process? The measure for that snapshot, I think, is around about 20 at this point. Okay, so it's been, it's been evolved to the point where the first halo is beginning to collapse. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So she's now actually should say she's now actually zooming in some of these and putting the gas in as well. Okay. Okay. So so that's kind of the, that's kind of state of the art. So round about. So if you want to do like the basic grid first, and you want to figure out where your your halos are going to be, you probably need to start off with something round about. 2,000 cube, and you're going to be starting with a kind of a co-moving cool megapar set, okay? And then you can just decide where you're going to zoom in, and then populate that simulation volume also with the baryons, um, and then you can choose whether you put in that streaming velocity or not. Obviously, it's more accurate if you do. Okay. Okay. So why do so? Come back to the question: Why is this? Um, so, go in front there. Ask the question: Why do you have this um, uh, 10 to the 5 solar masses being set in the? Uh, the point where they become sterile, uh, so they become fertile, and the reason is to, is to do with the chemistry in the gas. Okay, so the chemistry that is taking place here is this ion neutral reactions that I was mentioning the other day, and we're saying that in the in the ISM, in, in the present day ISM, these are particularly ineffective because these species here, this H minus and this H two plus, are very fragile and they get broken apart by photons, which we have lots of in the present day universe. In <coughs> When these uh, stars are forming in the early universe, the, 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 there aren't any of these photons to, uh, to break these um, intermediary species, so they can last for a long time, and then they can go on and actually create the H2. Okay, as we were saying before, it's a catalyzed reaction. You have these electrons, which are left over, and also the protons, which are left over as well. Okay, so they get recycled in the reaction. And what you can see there is that obviously the uh, amount of H2 you're going to form is going to depend quite critically on the ionization fraction that you have in your halo. So, okay, so it's important to be able to follow the chemistry well enough to be able to track the ionization fraction in the halos as they form. Okay. So why does it occur in halos around about 10 to 5? Well, you need the condition that the cooling time, to get any gas to collapse inside the halo, the cooling time has to be less than the Hubble time. Okay. Now below 7,000 Kelvin, H2 is the only useful coolant you have, okay? So if you want to be able to get your gas to cool, you're going to have to form H2. And you're going to have to form enough H2 that you satisfy this cooling criterion here, okay? So you have to be able to create enough H2 in those halos. And it turns out that when you get to a temperature around about 1,000 Kelvin, you start to create H2 fast enough that you start to be able to cool, okay? So it's only, and, and 1,000 Kelvin occurs when you get a mini halo of around about 10 to 5 solar masses, okay? A 10 to 4 solar, um, solar mass halo would have a very low temperature of maybe around about 500 Kelvin. It wouldn't form enough H2, and therefore its cooling time would be longer than the Hubble time, and it would just sit there sterile, okay? So that's the reason why you need to have that. And so you have this kind of str slightly strange kind of counterintuitive concept, which will keep popping up as, 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 as we talk here, that to get the thing to actually cool, you have to make it hot enough first. Okay? So kind of slightly counterintuitive. You'd imagine that star formation would be better if you had a lower temperature, because the, gary the baryons would be able to cool faster. Turns out they can't because, I'm um, sorry, it would be lower temperature because they have a genes mass. Turns out, yes, they might have a genes mass at some point. Probably they actually they don't. But they could do if they, if they were to gradually accumulate more and more mass. But the problem is that their cooling time would simply be longer than Hubble time, and they would never collapse. Okay. So that's very, very important. Any questions on that before I go on? Yes. <laughs> Two more. We start to collapse in the, in the general um, interhalo medium. It's around about 10 to minus 5. OK, and to get, so I'm saying? OK. And to get cooling to occur, you need 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 3 for the cooling to be effective. For this cooling uh, criterion to work. So just to make sure I understand what's going on, once the halo reaches above a critical temperature, the ionization fraction is high enough that the electrons and the protons can then form H2, which can then subsequently cool the gas to much lower temperatures and allow it 
You actually have enough electrons and um, uh, protons even before that. The problem is that the formation rate of H2, just in general, is not long enough. It's a very sensitive t uh, function of temperature. As you increase the temperature, these reactions occur much quicker, and then you get the H2. So it's not the um, ionization state, it's just the actual uh, kinetic energy and the random motions of the electrons and protons in order to get them to move. Exactly. It's to do with, to do with the collisional cross-sections of the, of the reactants. Yes, it is dependent on the density, on, on the number of density of the uh, of the ionization fraction as well. But you already have that uh, at lower temperatures. That condition has already been satisfied. So this one is just to get the H2 to form finally. Okay. Was there anything else? Okay. So coming back to this idea of what the H2 fraction is, how is it set? Well, we've just said that the ionization fraction. Uh, is, is, is important. You, you need these electrons, you need the protons. And if you had a very low ionization fraction, you obviously couldn't get this reaction to work. If you have a very high ionization fraction, it will go very rapidly. Um, the problem is that the ionization fraction is continually decreasing as the density increases in the gas. Okay. So um, the electrons and protons start to recombine as the density increases. And so you have this problem that the H2 is trying to form, but it's losing the electrons and protons at the same time. And so there's a balance there, and ends up what happens is the, 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 um, the recombination of the electrons and protons eventually wins, and that sets an upper limit to the maximum amount of H2 you can form by this process in a collapsing mini halo. Okay? It turns out that the, that, the, that the amount you can get is a few 10 to the minus 3. Okay? Just because at that point you start to run out of electrons and protons, and then the reaction rate drops to the point where it doesn't really continue anymore. You'll see that again in a couple of slides. Okay. So this process, although it's, it's very efficient, initially it then plateaus off and you can't get above 10 to the minus 3 H2 fraction. But that, ten, that is enough H2 to be able to cool the halo and allow star formation to proceed. Okay. So I just mentioned that's so what happens next. So this is a nice plot from uh, Naoki Yoshida's paper in 2006, and some of you may be familiar with it already. I just wanted to kind of, I showed it the other day and people were asking what the different stages here were. In fact, someone was asking, I can't remember who it was, was asking um, what was going on over here. Well, I'm actually going to focus on all the stages here and just kind of, kind of work you through what's happening in the halo as, as, as the gas collapses. Okay. Oh. So the first thing that happens is the gas falls into the halo and it can't cool, so it's kind of behaving adiabatically, so it shocks up to the virial temperature of the halo, right, which is set by the by the, uh, by the gravitational energy in the system. Okay? Now, during that process, the gas gets hot, and then eventually some of the H2 can form, so the H2 starts to rise. Okay? So it goes down from the, the that's the um, people were asking what the uh, H2 fraction in the halo medium there, you can see it's a, a few 10 to the minus 5. Okay? So the H2 starts to form during this um, shock in the mini halo. Eventually, at some point, the, 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 um, the H2 fraction is high enough that the gas can start to cool, and therefore it doesn't shock anymore. Also, it will just reach the virial temperature of the halo as well. Okay? So there's a kind of two effects there that are capping the top, te the top temperature. And at some point, the gas will start to cool. Again, the, H, uh, the H2 formation is continuing to rise at this point. So now what happens is that the H2 formation, I'm um, sorry, the, um, the H2 formation has got to the point now we have enough H2 to be able to cool the gas very effectively. And it turns out that the H2 is not in thermal equilibrium, right? It's in the non-LTE limit, which means its cooling goes as the den number density squared, okay? Now the heating rate from gravitational collapse goes as the number density to three halves, right? So the cooling wins, and so as you collapse to higher densities, the gas is able to cool as it collapses rather than heating up as it collapses. Okay, so you get this nice um, cooling regime here. Now, people have tried to kind of, uh, kind of say that this is very similar to what happens in the ISM, where you have C plus cooling and you get this cooling instability. It is not. C plus cooling is almost independent of temperature and it's just a very strong function of density. It goes to uh, uh, density to the, uh, to the power of 2 in the non-LTE uh, case. Here, the cooling for H2 is actually a very strong function of temperature, and it's beginning to become less effective as you go down. So it's not a true thermal instability like you have in the ISM. Okay, so please don't make that mistake. Um, at some point, you're also, like I was saying, the, the recombination um, occurs with electrons, and so your H2 fraction starts to plateau. And you see, it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of now for I mean, a very large range of densities here, it kind of sits there and does almost nothing. Okay. At some point, down here you see the temperature kind of hits a, hits a minimum, 
And that occurs around about an, a temperature around about 200 Kelvin. And so you say, well, OK, what's happening there? And what's happening is that the, um, the H2 cooling is only really excited very well above um, 512 Kelvin. That's where the J equals 2 rotational state is. And so below this temperature, it's dropping off exponentially. That's what I'm saying. It's, not a, it's, not a, it's a very, very strong function of temperature. Okay? And when you get to about 200 Kelvin or so, the H2 cooling becomes fairly ineffective for this amount of H2. If I had more H2, I could cool a little bit below 200 Kelvin. But for a few 10 to the minus 3, I can't. Okay? So I'd have to have more H2. I don't have that H2 because, again, the recombinations have set some plateau in, in, in what you're allowed. Okay? So that is limiting the amount of, um, it's limiting the bottom of this, of this temperature um, density curve here. Now the um, temperature and density here at this point are setting the genes mass in the halo, and that's going to be the genes mass at which the fragmentation inside the halo occurs, and it's going to set the characteristic mass of stars. Okay, so um, at this temperature and density, the genes mass is about 500 um, solar mass or so. It's much much higher than it is in present day star formation. You also see that the temperatures again are much much higher, and so you have a higher accretion rate. So people have always assumed that because of this, you have a very big genes mass, you have a very high accretion rate these stars are going to be massive in the early universe. They're not going to be like the one solar mass stars or 0.2 solar mass stars that, that prevail today. Okay? So that was the, that, that's the basis of that argument comes from, is just from this inflection point here in the temperature density diagram. Okay. Now as we go to higher densities, you see that the gas starts to gradually heat again. So what's happening there? Well, what's happened is the H2 has now reached its critical density. It's now cooling. Um, it's now in LTE cooling. And so the cooling rate now goes as n rather than n squared. However, we said that the gravitational compressional heating rate is going as, well, rho or n to the 3 halves. So the gravitational heating is winning over the cooling. Okay, so the, so the, the actual, the, um, the cooling time, if you like, is now longer than the, than the, um, the free fall time, and the gas will gradually heat up as it, as it continues to collapse. Okay, it has to heat up to be able to balance the heating rate that you have from the gravity. And so you get this gradual rise. You see a kind of a similar effect when you're looking at dust temperature cooling in the present day universe as well. OK, it's not quite as strong as that, but it's, it's similar. OK, any questions there before we go on? Yes? So what's happening? So, so in, in non-LTE, every time two atoms, uh, sorry, two molecules or a molecule collides, so let's say you get an H2. Um, molecule and you have a hydrogen. Right, so every time they collide, the energy level gets excited and it can radiate away. Okay? Okay. So, you radiate, so, it's your, so your amount of, um, of radiation you have which is then set by your Einstein A coefficient. Okay? Once you've hit the critical density or above, what's happening is that you, yes, you excite that, um, that energy level, but that energy level can be collisionally de-excited before it gets the chance to radiate away. Okay? And so you're robbing the gas of its ability to emit those photons. And so the cooling rate is then reduced. And you find if you work through the mathematics, which you can get in any standard um, Spitzer textbook, for example, you'll see that it comes out as it cools then as n rather than n squared. Okay? So you get an extra factor of n disappears. Okay. One, one simple way of understanding that is just saying high density, the gas goes to LTE. Sure. So the energy levels so become, so yeah, an LTE. Right. So, so the rate of emission is just proportional to how many emitters in that level of population. Anything else? OK. So um, you'll see here that you have this very dramatic rise in the H2 fraction. You're probably wondering what's happening. Well, at some point, um, the density and temperature become high enough that those three body reactions I was talking about before, we have three hydrogen or an H2 and two hydrogen, are able then to create H2 very, very effectively. And they manage to convert almost all the hydrogen into H2 within you know, a couple of decades in density. It's a very, very rapid change. And then once you get that um, um, huge amount of H2, you can then cool again much more effectively, which is why you see a plateauing in the temperature curve there. Okay, so the gas is then able to cool again. Um, uh, sorry, I had to kind of mix my slides up here in, in the order. So I um, just want to say a little bit more about the three-body H2 formation uh, regime. It's Chemically, it's very tricky, and thermodynamically, it's also very tricky, right? You have this reaction rate, which is going as n cubed, OK? So it's a very, very strong function of density, which is why it rises up so quickly in density space on that plot. 
And um, if you take one of the reaction rates, um, for example, uh, the one by Simon Glover here, um, and you plug in the numbers, and then you work out the heating rate as a result of this, for every hydrogen um, molecule you create, you heat the gas by 4.4 EV, you can work out a heating time. Um, I work, uh, you can work out a time scale for to create, uh, to create all the H2, and you can also work out a heating rate in the gas. And what you find is that when you get to number density around about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, the heating rate in the gas is much, much larger than you get from compressional heating due to gravity. Okay. So that becomes the dominant source of heat in the gas at that point. And what you tend to find is that the collapse slightly stalls very briefly while all that H2 is being converted. However, once the H2 is converted, then you've got a lot of coolant. Okay? And then the gas can again cool again. So you've got this very complicated regime where there's two competing forces um, which are trying to kind of do v v very different things to the gas. Okay? So it's a very difficult regime to get right in, in, in your calculation. You have to take care about it when you're trying to uh, solve it numerically. Yes? That's by, by 10 to 10, yeah. So but between 10 to 9, 10 to 10, you'll start to get that regime where everything starts to balance, OK? Now, before I go on, I should also say I mean, the reason I wanted to kind of have more time in this slide, the three-body reaction rate in this regime at a number density of around about 10 to the 8 and temperature of, a, of um, 1,000 Kelvin is uncertain by two orders of magnitude, OK? That's quite a lot. So um, the, the rate that we pick here, the um, Simon's one, is sitting in the middle. <laughs> So what we've done in the past was we try to, to, you know, if something's uncertain by two orders of magnitude and you think it's going to make a strong effect on your, um, your, your hydrodynamics and your thermodynamics, the best thing to do is a numerical ex um, experiment. And you just run two simulations where you pick the extremes. Okay? So the extreme rates are um, from um, Tom Abel, the so Abel et al. one, um, back in 2002, is, the, is the, the quickest rate, I, no, it's the slowest rate, I think. And there's one by Flower and Harris in, in 2007. Is, is the fastest one. And if you just do a simulation and you compare those two, you do see you, you actually do get differences in the, um, in the structure that comes out of that phase. Okay? So it is a very important phase. And the fact that it's uncertain is a big uncertainty in population three star formation. Okay? So at the moment, we normally just take the one in the middle and say, OK, this is the kind of canonical one. But obviously, that's not good. I mean, Simon would actually argue that his is the best, obviously, because so, um, he's, uh, he's doing the rate a little bit more carefully than some of the others have done. But still. Um, it's also extremely difficult to measure this in the lab. Um, Dan, um, I've forgotten the name. Sorry, um, we're um, um, being. Oh, Simon sometimes collaborates with uh, people who do actual experiments to try and measure these reaction rates. Um, so he's a kind of physical chemist, and they were interested in the fact that this one is so uncertain, and maybe trying to get a handle on what this case should be, but. It's extremely difficult to do this in the lab because you have to get three hydrogens sitting there doing nothing and then let them go, right? <laughs> you have to keep doing that in different temperature regimes to actually figure out what's going on. So, okay, it's going to be a long time before that's actually been done properly in the lab. And at the moment, people are saying they think it's kind of impossible for the, for the time being. Okay, so you're reduced to having theoretical um, um, approximations for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, do I have the same slide duplicated? Yeah, I did. OK, <laughs> that's what happened. So um, as you get to higher densities, you've just created all this H2. The density is getting very, very high. Um, your gas is trying to cool via H2 line cooling. And the problem is that then the opacity of the H2 starts to rise, right? because you just have all that H2 column there, and the photons can't escape. And because of that, the, you find that the temperature then starts to rise again. So it enjoys a little bit of a dip and then gradually starts to rise again. So for about a decade in density, it can cool very efficiently. And then after that, it's like, oh, I can't, I can't cool anymore. And people have looked at this little dip here, and they try to see that, well, you know, perhaps in that little dip, you can, it, gas can fragment again. You've got this little time where you can cool faster than the freefall time. And any time you can do that, it's a chance for you to fragment. Right? And so people thought that this ke uh, chemothermal instability that occurs here would allow you to create mo more fragmentation. Turns out, so Naoki Yoshida actually in, I don't know if it was this paper or the 2007 one, I think it was this one, examines that and actually finds that the regime is quite stable. Okay? Had it lasted for longer in density space, then it wouldn't be stable. But due to the fact that it's just only one decade in density or so, um, it actually is not enough time for the ga ga gas to fragment sufficiently during that. Thomas Greif also has a new paper on this where he is claiming it is more efficient. I don't really understand the differences, I must confess. So, But you can go and look that up if you wish. OK, so what happens at higher densities? Well, we, the gas obviously doesn't go each straight away adiabatic. Something else is, is happening there. You can see it's still the temperature is only gradually rising with the density. So what's going on? 
And what's happening is a thing called collision-induced emission. And that's when you have two H2 molecules come together for a brief time and they create this big super molecule with a dipole. Okay? And then you can have all sorts of um, uh, transitions for the electrons inside that super molecule. Okay? Uh, it allows them to cool very, very efficiently and it's, um, it, it creates a continuum of, of points because you have the electrons in this, in this kind of random orientation. Okay? And you, you can have various energy states as the two H2 come together. Okay? So that allows you to cool via continuum and continuum cooling is always very good. So if you can push your um, cooling over a continuum rather than a channel, you're always doing better. And it allows you to cool very efficiently for, again, about a decade or two in density, right? So you get from around about 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 15, uh, a number of densities. Beyond that point, it, uh, CIE cooling also becomes optically thick eventually. The continuum becomes optically thick. Um, and then eventually you, um, you reach this point here where the gas is still cooling. You see it's, not, it's still not rising. And the reason why it's not rising is it's now breaking apart H2. Okay, so as the gas um, gets hotter, you get collisional dissociation of the H2 molecules, and that releases that 4.4 EV that you packed into the gas um, over here when you're forming the H2. Okay? So you can think of it in a kind of a strange way. So the, the collapse stores energy for later and then breaks it again further over. Okay? So the collisional dissociation cooling really isn't a cooling term. It's more like you just put the gas, you put something somewhere, and again, it can be used later. Okay? There's not an external um, source of heating and cooling there. It's all internal. It's just here it was able to cool effectively through H2 line cooling and didn't need to break the H2, whereas here it does. Okay? So that's the very stages that kind of make up the population three star formation picture. Once it runs out of H2, you've got a star. Okay, that's essentially you hit the hydrostatic core. And what you notice here is that if you're used to present day star formation where you have a regime where you have um, for number densities of 10 to the 5 or so, you kind of go as a thermal, or, uh, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong plot. Um, way down here in the temperature curve, you go way down here, you have an isothermal regime, then you have the optically thick regime from dust, then it would go isothermal again roughly as it breaks H2, and then it goes optically thick again. You don't have those different stages in population 3 star formation. Okay? It just goes straight to the star. Okay? So there is not, not that intermediate stage you have with dust cooling. Okay. Okay, so that was one path to population three star formation, and that's what people have now started to call. Oh, sorry, no question. I'd love to. That's a good question. <laughs> um, it kind of all happens on the free fall time at the density here, which is, a number, which is around about a number density of one, maybe a little bit lower. Okay. So you're looking at 10 to the 7 years or so. Okay. From the point at which it, so from here, at point C, which is at a few 10 to the 3, you're looking at number densities. So you're looking at time scales of less than a mega year. Okay. And you know, you might have thought, well, you said that, I mean, I, I was saying that the gas briefly halts its collapse over here at, at these high densities when H2 is forming and you get that feedback from the chemistry. The problem is the densities are so high there, you can sit there for many, many free fall times and compared to the free fall time here, it's nothing, right? So in terms of, it doesn't really make any difference. So in terms of local free fall times, the gas can hang around over here, but in terms of original free fall time, it's just still collapsing, okay? Just around about a mega year from that point. Good question. Anything else? Okay, so different paths to population three star formation. You've heard about this, um, you probably heard those POP 3.1s and POP 3.2s. People are now saying that, well, you should distinguish between stars which formed truly in isolation and stars which may be formed near other stars. Okay, so I'm going to explain well, why is that the case, why people come up with that idea. And population 3.2 star formation is star formation that has been, um, it has involved HD cooling at some point. So that's um, an H2 molecule now. We've taken one of the hydrogens and replaced it with deuterium. Okay. So HD forms is formed and destroyed with hydrogen via these reactions here. You see H2 and D plus, and then eventually you get HD and H plus, and then it gets destroyed again. It collides with H plus and forms back into H2. And above, um, around about 460 Kelvin or so, these keep, these keep occurring. But the problem is that this one is exothermic and this one's endothermic. And so below this point, this one starts to win. The top one starts to win, right? And then you start to create more and more HD, OK? And you have this kind of thing happening, uh, occurring called chemical fractionation, which is when the ratio of the molecule of HD 
over H2 is greater than you would expect just from looking at the abundances of the two isotopes. Okay? So, so HD has only got an abundance of 10 to the minus 5 or so, okay? so it's very, very low. However, HD can, if all that HD was converted into, sorry, if all that deuterium was converted into HD, then the HD fraction would also be 10 to the minus 5. Okay? The H2 fraction, we said, is 10 to the minus 3. And so this ratio here would be, you know, would be 10 to the minus 2. Okay? 10 to the minus 2 is a much bigger number than this, and that's called chemical fractionation. Okay? It's where you get, more, um, you get more of this than you'd expect just from the elemental abundances of what you've got. Okay? It turns out that this is very important because when you get HD cooling, you can cool much more effectively. Okay? So around about um, 460 Kelvin, this becomes more important. Once you've hit around about 200 Kelvin or so, you now have 10 times more HD than you expect to have just by straight elemental abundance. <clears throat> and HD is a very efficient coolant, um, much more efficient than H2. It has a dipole now, right? Okay, so you can get dipole out transitions, they're much more efficient coolant. And it can cool the gas all the way down to the um, CMB temperature. And round about a redshift of, you know, we're saying a redshift of 20 to 16, that ends up as a temperature around about 40 Kelvin or so. Okay? So the dip in that curve is now no longer 200 Kelvin, it's now done at 40 Kelvin. And so people have said, well, the genes mass in the original and the original curve was around about 500 solar masses or so, and that's what was setting the mass of pop three stars. And they said, well, okay, so these population three stars that form with HD being important can, um, can get all the way down to having genes masses of around about 50 solar masses, which is much, you know, it's still big compared to a star forming in the present day universe, but it's not the super, you know, bear moths that we were thinking it was um, from the previous calculation. And also the accretion rates, you know, C cubed over G, you know, dropped by a factor of 100 here in the temperature. Um, Roughly, uh, sorry, not quite, but in fact, it's a five or six or so. So then you're, you're changing the accretion rate onto these stars as well. And so the idea is that they behave very differently. And people thought there was then two, that the, um, the IMF of population three stars was in some way bimodal. You had the very first stars forming, which were very, very big. And then you had this second generation, which were forming, which could have been much smaller. Okay. As we've seen since then, the field has evolved a little bit. We now see there's much more chaos and confusion in between these two regimes. And that has uh, you know, not quite panned out as the way people thought it was. And I should say that nobody has done a self-consistent calculation, at least to my knowledge, of a pop 3.2 star all the way down. Okay, so that still hasn't been done. So how do you get that H2 cooling to be excited? Um, well, we said that you, know, you can't really get below 200 Kelvin normally with H2 cooling for the normal abundance. You need to get below H2 cooling for HD to be important, for it, for it actually to become an important coolant in the gas. So the question is, how do you get there? And you get there basically by having more electrons and, and, and protons in the gas. And so you form slightly more H2 in that initial phase, which means you've got the ability to cool a little bit below 200 Kelvin. Okay? And um, how you get those extra electrons and photons can occur in two different ways. One way is that you can have a nearby star. It shines, it starts to um, photoionize the gas inside the halo where the star is trying to form. You get elevated um, abundance of electrons, you then form more H2 and you can then cool. So that's again it's slightly counterintuitive. You'd think having a star nearby would be bad for star formation and make the gas hotter. Again, it's an another kind of strange paradox in population three star formation. Having a star nearby is actually making the gas colder in this sense, okay? If it hits that sweet spot where it's able to form just enough. Um, um, free electrons and protons um, to help the H2 be catalyzed. The other way you can do it is actually if you just go to, if you just wait, if the universe waits for slightly longer, which obviously it is doing, you have all these dark matter mini halos forming and they're getting gradually more and more massive. Eventually they get to the point where they get massive enough that the, that the virial shock in the halo is enough to start to collisionally ionize some of the hydrogen that comes in. And then you again, you start to free up the electrons, create protons, and again, you can catalyze that H2 information channel. Okay? So you create electrons, more electrons, that gives you more H2. More H2 gives you colder gas. Colder gas gives you HD, and HD can cool you down to the CMB temperature. Right? So it's a very kind of complicated chain. Okay? So if you don't get the chemistry of all that right, you're going to get the thermodynamics and the dynamics wrong as well. So people have done these calculations, beautiful calculations. Naoko Yoshida has this really nice one where he keeps zooming in. He's, you know, he's got a mini halo. You've all seen Tom Abel's simulation, I'm sure, where he starts with you know, the universe and then zooms into a star forming in the center. It's very impressive, right? And they've zoomed in onto all these different scales. And they've been able to follow that chemistry and cooling, as I've been talking about there. And you know, they really pioneered this, uh, 
this, uh, the, this subject. And they kind of zoomed in, zoomed in, zoomed in, eventually get down to, you know, 25 solar radii, okay, and they're getting all the way down from the universe down to 25 solar radii. It's very impressive. But the problem is then they stop, okay? Then they say, okay, that's done. <laughs> We're done. And the reason why is because the, um, the you know, they're the killed by the current time. You have to model a sound wave bouncing around inside 25 solar radii at the same time as trying to model the universe, okay? And as you have this huge difference in time scales and you can't solve it, okay? Now we know that, you know, I'll talk more about this tomorrow as well, I'll be talking about sink particles. Sink particles have been introduced to solve this problem. Basically what you do in a sink particle is you say, well, I don't really care what's going on in this scale and slightly smaller, I'm going to put a point mass in there that can just gobble the gas. Okay, so it just eats that thing up. And what that means is I can then, while this bit in the middle has been taken care of, I can then watch what happens to the gas around here. Okay? Now that wasn't done in population three star formation, so much people were kind of either didn't have sink particles because they they were just getting to this point, right? So they were, you know, that, that, that's where the field was at the time. Or they just treated them with huge suspicion, which, you know, is fair enough because they do, you know, they do violate all the, the fluid equations inside your code and they're doing something very, very kind of kludgy. But they are necessary evil if you want to be able to evolve the system for any length of time and see what happens. So the question is, you have this disk here, you see it has this nice spiral structure, it has this very strong M equals 2 spiral, and we know from present day star formation that if you see that strong M equals 2 spiral, very often the gas fragments and to form a binary system or even higher order multiples. Okay? So the question was, is that going to form one big star or will it fragment into a whole cluster of small things? So um, what we did in our group in Heidelberg actually was we're taking the kind of computational framework from present day star formation, which involves zinc particles a lot, and then merging it with the chemistry and cooling that people were doing here, and then we're able to follow this system for longer. Okay? And what we found was that yes, indeed, the gas does then break up. Okay, so here's a, a simulation we did back in 2010, 2011, and it's following that system that Naoki was showing in his plot, but just a little bit further, right? And we're only following it here pardon me, for an extra 100 years, not even that long. And already what's happened is you get this big M equals 2 spiral. Eventually, it's not symmetric because you know, there's, there's instabilities in the gas, the gas coming in. Also, the system itself is just generally chaotic and very unstable. And as soon as you break the symmetry of the M equals 2 spiral, you squeeze one um, of the spirals up, and it can fragment. Okay? And in this case, it does fragment. If the cooling time is short enough, I should, should point out, in this case it was, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, and you were able to form a star. right? And then we found, oh, another guy is starting to form over here again. There's some asymmetry in the system now. This guy now gets squeezed, it forms another one, and again, and again, and again. We found it kept fragmenting as, as, as the simulation went on. Okay. Now, I should also say that we also did have some very, very simple heating uh, prescription from the central star here. And you, know, you think, well, the central star is, is accreting like crazy. It should be able to protect, you know, should be able to keep that disk stable. Turns out that it, it can't. And one of the reasons why is that the star in the center is only 0.5 solar masses. <laughs> this is so early in the system, the disk fragments so quickly that it's not had time to build up a massive star which then would stabilize the system. Okay. So we have a fragmentation time scale there of a, of a few hundred years. Okay. Now, people said, well, you know, you're using SPH. You know, <laughs> SPH is terrible. And, you know, Caitlin was talking about you know, all the problems with viscosity, uh, et cetera, that you have in these disks. And disks are inherently very difficult to model, as Caitlin was talking about last week. And she is correct. We tried to use as many particles as we could here. So we had a few hundred thousand in the disk, a wee bit more. Um, but, you know, you're still gonna be, there's still going to be viscosity in there. What we were saying was, well, you know, because you have this big M equals 2 spiral, that is actually the dominant mode of, of, of angular momentum transport. It does turn out to be correct. We actually kind of worked out what the angular momentum transport was, and that is correct. But you know, you always do worry about the viscosity and et cetera. And it'd be good to try the same thing with a different fluid method, completely different. So we're not using SPH um, and see if it works. The problem was that you know not very many people were doing this in population of the star formation, as I said. You know, most of the groups were just looking at the first collapse going all the way down to the star. So Thomas Greif was using a repo at the time, so we've heard a little bit about this code. Um, over the week, and uh, that's a code written by Fokker Springle and, um, and Jim was talking about it, I think on Monday, we're talking about Monday, right? um, and used this Lagrangian, not Lagrangian mesh, but used this um, um, totally adaptive mesh, uh, a moving mesh where the, the mesh tries to move as quasi Lagrangianly with the flow, and so it's doing like uh, less flux work over, this, over the cell boundaries. And Thomas had basically the same chemistry and cooling that we had used in the previous uh, models, and then he was able to then rerun the simulation with the repo to figure out what happens there. And again, he had sink particles, 
and he was again able to see that that system in the, in the middle broke up. He was actually able to follow it for much, much longer. He's a longer time than I was able to follow it in my calculation, and he's seen a much more chaotic system. Okay. He also, I should say that in this SPH simulations, to get the resolution that you needed in the center, we had to split the particles, right? Which means you take the box. So in our case, we're taking the box. We then say, OK, the particles in the middle, I want to make them smaller. I take that particle out. I put in smaller particles, but I'm kind of spraying them in randomly. Okay, when you do that in SPH, you create all this small scale noise. Okay, and what that does is it creates a little pressure term locally while it tries to damp out the chaos that you've just put in. If you do it in a small enough scale, it shouldn't affect the large scale structure, but it, and it should wipe out, uh, wipe itself out on the sound crossing time. So if you've got a very very small scales, it should it should it should damp fairly quickly. But it does create a small pressure term for that time when you're doing it, which can then wash out structure and turbulence in your cloud. Um, you don't have to do that in a repo. And so Thomas's flows coming in were much more chaotic than ours were, and he gets a more chaotic disk structure. Right? It wasn't quite as nice M equals two spiral as ours was to begin with. But no, but nonetheless, he still finds the same thing here that this um, cluster forms in the centre. You don't really have one star, you have a bunch. And you know, if you look at the mass function that comes out of these early stages, at least it seems to be flat. Yes, question. You do the particle splitting uh, midway through the calculation. Yep. Okay. So, so what we did was we, we yeah. We, so some people, I think Naoki actually has this on the fly. Maybe some of the guys from Naoki's group, Shingo. Naoki does his particle splitting as the simulation progresses. Right? He doesn't stop and start. Is that right? Naoki in his particle splitting, his particle splitting algorithm. You know, maybe you don't know. Okay, I think I think what Naoki is doing is he's actually as the simulation is going, he says every time he gets close to violating the genes length or by his genes criterion, he says, okay, now I have to create more particles. And he takes the guys in the center and splits them. What we did was actually we kind of said, well, I want to just be a little bit more careful. And we took a much much bigger region, so we let it collapse to high densities, then went back and said, OK, these particles went into the center, took this big region, we collapsed it, we split it, we ran it again, <laughs> went back, and then we kept doing it in, in, in different stages to try and minimize the amount of noise that we put in the system. But we still had noise. So right. that's fundamentally different than, than starting out with the zoomed-in simulation where you know where, where is the... It is kind of a zoom. It's just a zoom. You're doing it in kind of a, kind of a dumb way, right? You're kind of going all the way in. It's not adaptive on its fly. No? That's right. We've using the Lagrangian history of the SPH. I know that that particle went to the center, so I can then go back and say I need to split this one. And you try and do it at low enough densities. We try to do this all at densities which are fairly low before, actually, even before the three-body heating came in, because we're worried about creating horrible effects as you went through that regime. Okay. So. But yeah. So it was nice to see that Thomas using a repo which does it on the fly, does it adaptively as you're creating. You can just insert mesh points as you're going. And he was able to um, do that much better. So that was encouraging. So that was good. You know, the same basic idea, um, and there's been other studies. So Rowan Smith was looking at the feedback and how it affects his fragmentation. Again, seeing that the feedback in these early times doesn't really do very much. It seems to be that the gas is inherently unstable. So why is it inherently unstable? So here's a picture from a, from a paper where we just looked at the pro radio properties of the disk. Um, at some different times. So he's looking at just a few different times. So one is at the point of star formation is light blue, and then the point where the disk is actually fragmenting. Uh, yes, yeah, so the point where the disk is actually about to fragment. So, so by star formation, I mean the central object is formed at, the, at this point, and the point where the disk is about to fragment is now this uh, black line. And what you find was several things. First of all, that um, the gas has a high H2 fraction. So again, remember, we're talking about 0.5 is fully molecular in these units. So gas is a high H2 fraction out at you know, 10 AU, and it stays fairly high. I mean, this, this is a very small range here. Fairly high all the way out. Okay, so you have this very, very high H2 disk, which wasn't actually predicted by the, um, by the models of, for example, uh, uh, Jonathan Tan and Chris McKee. They were thinking that the disk was going to be completely dissociated at this point, and it was going to be cleaned by Lyman alpha. The reason why is they didn't realize that the three-body reaction is so fast, every time you break the hydrogen, it just immediately reforms again. Okay? It's already much faster than the free-fall time at a number density of 10 to the 10. Once you up at these densities in the disk, that three-body reaction is going way faster. Right? So it goes as n cubed, remember. So the disk is always H2. And that means that the disk is able to cool very effectively. And if you look at the uh, if you study the tumor Q parameter of the disk, you see it drops below one. Remember, Caitlin was talking about that last week. Okay, so this becomes just gravitationally unstable, and it can't do anything. So why does it become gravitationally unstable? 
And the reason why is that it cannot transfer the angular momentum that's being fed in from the inflowing material from the, for, uh, from the envelope. So in this plot, we're basically just taking the accretion rate through spherical shells in the case of the envelope that's given here by this um, line at the top. We then look at the accretion rate through the disk down here. And then what we're doing is we were then saying, OK, for a given property, so for, for the properties of my disk, what would the effective alpha, remember this alpha viscosity that we were talking about last week in Caitlin's plots? What if alpha viscosity, what would, if I had an alpha viscosity of 1, what would the disk accretion rate be, <coughs> basically, is what we're doing. And you can find, yeah, here it's kind of stable, and alpha of 1 could stabilize the disk. At, a high, at a far radii, it's not enough, right? And what Caitlin was showing is that you can't really get above an alpha of 1 in a disk. You can't, from gravitational torques and from Reynolds stresses from the spiral arm, you can't get a bigger alpha, right? So that basically is the limit to what a disk can do. If you feed the disk faster than it can accrete that angular momentum, it will just break, OK? And then once it breaks into the binary system, then that quite nicely absorbs the angular momentum, and you don't have to worry about it going to the disk anymore, OK? So that's basically what's happening there. OK. So. That was all very nice, and you know we had this, you know, this lovely picture of a disc. It looked really nice, and everyone was very happy. But then Matt Turk came along and tried to spoil it all. Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Mm he didn't include it. Right, for the most part. So he was actually finding fragmentation on smaller <laughs> scales. In fact, the simulation he did without the sink particles, trying to resolve the star, he has no accretion luminosity at all. He did put it in, I think, in his calculations just to check. And then Rowan Smith did a follow up paper on that as well. But yeah. So actually, what, um, the accretion luminosity um, is what's causing this high temperature here, right? It's what's stabilizing the inner disk, essentially. And then around about 10, e, t t uh, 10 AU, the accretion luminosity isn't efficient enough and it can't keep the disk hot, and the disk can then just uh, fragment. But yeah, it does stabilize the inner disk. So we find without the accretion luminosity, I get fragmentation inside 10 AU. With it on, I then suppress the fragmentation up to 10 AU. A little bit beyond. Yeah, but yeah, good question. OK, so that was a lovely picture. And we were all, we, 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 well, we were all very happy. Then Matt Turk came along and tried to spoil it. And uh, then we were all very annoyed. So what was he saying? He was saying that. As you increase the resolution, so it's a low resolution simulation here with so many cells per gene's length, as you increase the resolution, going to higher resolution across here, the disk goes away. Oh, not good. Okay, so then we're all annoyed. Right? So he's basically saying that we had problems with com numerical convergence. In some way, that our angular momentum wasn't being transferred enough, and so the angular momentum was welling up in the center, and we were getting a disk when perhaps we shouldn't have. Yeah. However, Thomas Greif noted that in his simulation, he had a very similar resolution to what uh, Matt was presenting in this paper. And so he was like, that's kind of strange, because he does see a disk early times. Again, I mentioned it's a little bit messier, because you've got a less viscous code. They can resolve the turbulence, the subsonic uh, velocities a bit better. But you see, you know, Mark's, uh, so Matt's using Enzo, and he's, you know, that's a, it's not as viscous as SPH in these scales. And he also has this big M equals to his spiral, OK? And then it goes away, suddenly goes away. What's happening? OK, so we were confused, because Thomas wasn't seeing this effect, and he was using very high resolution, kind of comparable to at least halfway between these two, if not this one, in his simulations. And so he didn't really know what was going on. Um, a paper came out recently showing that, depending on how you do chemistry, <laughs> treat that chemistry in cooling, the coupling, um, can make a huge difference to the thermodynamics of the gas that is collapsing. OK, so this paper by Bovino et al. was taking the Enzo code and then using different ways of solving the chemistry and cooling within it. One of them was a high order, um, I think a second order backwards difference solver that was put in by Matt Turk. Um, and then he finds he gets these with, with increasing the resolution, he finds you know, these um, solid lines here are um, with the high order scheme. And you find that as you increase the resolution, it converges to a result. The other lines here is using a very crude backwards order um, where you're only doing was actually a forwards, I think he's actually doing a forwards oiler um, with um, no error control. So you're just doing one iteration step and without really coupling the, uh, the chemistry and the cooling. And what he's finding is then it's very, very sensitive to the, um, in, into the resolution. In fact, it's just noise. Okay? It's not converging at all. Okay, so that's with Enzo. That was, both these calculations, were, these two sets of calculations were done with Enzo. It turns out when Matt was doing his paper in the previous one, 
he wasn't doing the second order one that he created <laughs> himself. He kind of fell back for some reason, I'm not entirely sure which uh, reason. He fell back to using the simpler one, and then he was getting basically non-convergence in his thermodynamics as he's moving to higher and higher um, resolution. And so a lot of his features which he sees here just simply went away, which is chaos and noise. So if you don't, and that's, that's all happening in that three-body H2 information regime, right? So if you don't resolve that regime correctly and carefully, you will get results which do not numerically converge. Okay? So you have to be very careful how you solve the chemistry and thermodynamics. Okay. So clearly, H2 line cooling is important as well. We, we mentioned that's the main dominant coolant here, and it becomes optically thick at some point. And um, I think yesterday I was talking about you know you can use um, Sobolev lengths as a way of treating the optically thick line cooling. Um, the problem with the optically thick, the problem with the Sobolev approximation is that it only really works, as we're saying, if you have um, kind of monolithic um, uh, velocity gradient and you have highly supersonic velocities. And then it becomes pretty good. And the other thing that you need to do is because you're you're, you're creating a length scale and using a local density and you're extrapolating the properties at that local point over that length scale. And that might not be true. Right? And in fact, what you find is that um, the H2 fraction changes rapidly enough with density in population 3 star formation because of that, um, that you know, it goes as n cubed, right? It's going very, very fast. It changes rapidly enough over, short, uh, over very short length scales that if you work out a Sobolev length, um, you actually you have this huge column of H2, which just isn't physical, right? You're overestimating the column Im immensely, and then you underestimate the amount of cooling that you get from the H2 line. Okay. Now, the other problem is, that obviously, that the, uh, the disks in, um, in population 3 star formation uh, and the collapse in general, um, the velocities and the velocity gradients you have are round about sonic. Okay? They're not really that supersonic. Okay? So again, the sublev length breaks down, and that's a problem. Okay, so there's two reasons why sublev length doesn't really work and will overestimate your, 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 your optical depth that you're applying to your, um, to your escape probability to do your line cooling. And so what we have, a, we have a student, Tillman Hartwig, um, in, in Heidelberg, and he's been looking at improving this. And he was, what he was doing was using our tree call algorithm, because it, it can store the H2 columns. And it also knows about the velocities in gadget, because the tree in gadget stores velocities for drifting the tree nodes when it does the gravity. And then you can say, well, how much H2 column do I have within the line width of the thing that's actually trying to emit? Okay, I can ignore the, um, the H2 in nodes, in tree nodes, which are moving faster than the line width, and they're Doppler shifted outside. Okay, so he gets a much better estimate of the cooling from that, and he finds that, again, he gets much colder temperatures down here. So these are different ways of combining the sublev length and the tree column. For the most accurate one, the one that's trying to do it properly, he really does get very cold um, disk forming. Whereas for the standard one, it heats up very, very rapidly. Okay? So it gets very different results. So probably we've underestimated the amount of cooling substantially by orders of magnitude in population 3 star formation. And the chances are then that it can cool much more efficiently and then um, potentially fragment more. He's been looking at the fragmentation um, in some you know, just generally rotating, solid body rotation um, calculations. And he does find that the fragmentation is increased when you have a better estimate of the cooling. Um, those are very simple and idealized calculations. He's now using ones from Mei Sasaki, that dark matter picture I was showing you at the beginning. She's now doing high resolution ones with the repo, and he's now using um, uh, full cosmological initial conditions to see if this actually holds in a cosmological environment as well. But we think it does. So something to watch out for. Um, also remember collision-induced emission cooling um, is also there, and it's also very important. We're seeing it becomes awfully thick at some point. I just wanted to point out some nice work that Shingo Hirano has been doing with um, um, uh, Noki Yoshida, and he's been looking at different ways of approximating the uh, collision just emission cooling and the H2 cooling, and finds, yeah, you can get very, very different dynamics and, and setups um, depending on how you treat it. And Shingo's here, so if you want to ask him what he's doing there, then please go ahead. So that's, that's, that, that's also very nice. So we have to be very careful how we're treating those heating and cooling processes. So I think that's probably me done. Um, any more questions? Or should we stop for coffee? No? Nope. Okay.